Hello and welcome to this breakout session on planning a community court. At the Center for Court Innovation, community justice often looks like a community court or a community justice center, like the Midtown Community Court or the Red Hook Community Justice Center, the through line with those models being creating or enhancing local initiatives that really serve to stretch justice to include both engaging the local community as well as healing through targeted services. I'm Lindsay Price Jackson. I'm a senior program manager um, on the community justice team doing training and technical assistance for the Center for Court Innovation. And today I'm joined with four wonderful guests who are here to talk about their experiences in planning community courts. I'll name them and allow them to introduce themselves in just a moment. First, we have Diane Gibson, Chief of Community Courts, City Attorney's Office, South Dallas Community Court in Dallas, Texas. Next, we have David Kling, Lead Community Court Prosecutor with the Spokane Community Court in Spokane, Washington. Next, Judge Jennifer G. Housen, Presiding Judge of District and Municipal Courts, coming from the Skagit County Community Court in Skagit, Washington. And finally, Deborah McFadden Bryant, Business Process Improvement Specialist with the Albany Works Community Court in Albany, Georgia. So now I'll ask each of our panelists in turn to take a few minutes to one, describe the genesis of your court program, and two, to give us a snapshot of what it looks like today. So I'll start with you, Diane. Hi, my name is Diane Gibson. I am with the City Attorney's Office of Dallas, Texas. Chris Queso is our City Attorney. And we have five community courts located throughout the City of Dallas and two specialty courts. One of the greatest things about us is that we're a court that actually handle quality of life crimes. And by handling quality of life crimes, it just means class C misdemeanors. And so none of those are jellable offense, but what we entail to do is that we want to help the whole community. So when a person comes into community court and they enter a plea of guilty or no contest because we're strictly a plea court, it's not jellable offenses. So when you enter that plea, we do a complete assessment on that individual to find out what are some of the underlying problems? How can we help that person? So once we identify the problems, we then make the recommendation to the prosecutor because the prosecutor will now incorporate that into the recommendation to the judge, which will then entail incorporate that into their probation. So they're placed on six months probation. And if it's to get idea of look for housing or look for employment, those are some of the things that the judge will incorporate in that condition of their probation. They will then be um, asked to return to court every two weeks or once a month if they're already employed. If not, they will come back every other week. So we wanna just keep them in a comprehensive case management plan so that we're able to help them to reach those goals that we have actually set for them. Thank you, Diane. All right, next we're gonna hear from David Kling. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, my name is David Kling. I've worked for the city of Spokane, Washington for 15 years. Uh, for the last three and a half years, uh, I've had a role as the lead community court prosecutor in our three community courts that we have. Um, in late 2013, we will celebrate our 10th anniversary with our downtown location. That's the primary one. We're quite proud of that. Um, even in my three and a half years, uh, I experienced the, the pre-COVID world, the shutdown, uh, the restart. And now I really feel like we've got the momentum that we've been looking for, a momentum that uh, we're thankful for because it was kind of a reset in the last couple of years, and I feel like it's the kind of refresh that's going to point us in the right direction. Um, our downtown primary location is uh, unique because it's housed in the central library right downtown right across the street from an upscale mall. Uh, out of all places that you would expect to see a court that would not be it, but it is um, a very welcoming location. Um, we also have two satellite expansion locations uh, in different neighborhoods that also try to address different uh, populations with different needs. Um, but the majority of the population that we work with and that we look to assist is unhoused in the downtown core. Um, we do uh, have a unique uh, geographic situation because Spokane, Washington is the largest city 
on I-90 between Seattle and Minneapolis, so spanning several states. So we do have some people that um, stay for longer than just a, just a visit, and it's our job to try to get them set up um, and feel like they um, can participate and take ownership in this community that we all call home. Thank you for having me today. Absolutely. Thank you so much, David. Next, we'll hear from Judge Housen. I am Judge Jennifer Housen, and I am located in Skagit County, Washington, which is about 50 minutes north of Seattle, Washington, and 50 minutes south of Vancouver, British Columbia. And the genesis for our community court came from me sitting on the bench. I was doing the jail calendars day after day, week after week. And within about three months, I realized that I was seeing all the same people and they were cycling through the jail. And I just looked around and had to figure out what could possibly change this. So people were spending more time in jail than they needed to on the kinds of low level misdemeanors that I was sitting on the bench for. And so I looked around and first place I found was the Spokane court and also one in Olympia, Washington. And I said, we need something like this here. Uh, the adversarial system was not working. And so I began doing my research and our county is unique in the sense that it's very large population of diverse farmlands. And there are five cities within the county and each of those cities has a unique uh, population of individuals. So one of the, so I, what we did was develop a centralized team that travels to each of the municipal courts. So I am the presiding judge of the district court, which covers the entire county, and then each of the city municipal courts. So we, in each city, like I said, has a unique personality. One is a logging town, one is a fishing town, one is a, a, a large population of Hispanic farm, farm workers. And then there's a retail corridor on, on the uh, freeway. Uh, and so each city has a unique personality and unique issues. But what we found was that the providers for the services that these individuals all needed to stop the recidivism cycle was a centralized team of providers. So we developed a program uh, that the centralized team of, of providers and advocates for community court travels to each of the cities on a different day of the week. And so that's the genesis of our program in Skagit County. Thank you, Judge. And finally, Deborah McFadden Bryant, tell us about your program. Great. My name is Deborah McFadden Bryant, and I am the business process uh, specialist for the city of Albany. And it's interesting in the sense that we kind of fell into this. Um, to give some perspective, I've got to kind of let you know where Albany is. Um, you know, people always got, it, got us confused with Albany, New York. We're in the southwest corner of Georgia. We're 90 miles from Tallahassee, Florida. We're two and a half hours from the Gulf of Mexico beaches. We're three hours from Atlanta and six and a half hours from New Orleans. Uh, for some perspective there. And what it is, is the city itself is a hub right in the middle of agricultural uh, uh, geographies. And because it is the largest city in that area, most of the counties that surround us, the socioeconomic levels are very, very poor. And people come into the city of Albany for basic human uh, services, uh, social services. And so we have a large population of people seeking uh, services or not having uh, the opportunities uh, that you would expect to take, a grant, take for granted in larger cities. What happened is as a part of the work in working with the court in looking at their basic systems, we stumbled over some information. As I did the research, we were, I was looking at oh, about 16 months worth of data and saw that we looked at about 10,000 cases that came through during that time. We had about a 34% uh, group of people who had multiple citations. And at the same time, what was really interesting is there was a 50% recidivism rate where people on the same charges, just to the first degree, second degree, to third degree, which led us to see that we weren't getting to any root causes. And as a part of that conversation, uh, our city manager said, there's got to be something that the city can do to help our citizens get to the kinds of services they need because why are they coming here? Why are they always in court? And on the basis of that, we set up a, and developed a pilot program to see and understand what was happening and what we could do. And as we built that pilot and learned from that, 
we started doing more and more research and we stumbled over the Center for Court Innovation and found that the kinds of things that we wanted to do in expanding our restorative justice pro uh, program with the court, there were people doing that. And we got connected and started pursuing the concept of community court. Great to hear. Thank you so much, everyone, for all those details. And it's easy to see that we've got a group here that is not just geographically diverse, but it's working with very different populations, very different demographics, and really had different beginnings, right? Different origins. Um, but I think we can all agree that a very important thing to the origin of any type of alternative or or um, innovative program like this is to build relationships, to find allies, and to really get others to catch your vision to help support you in the upstart process. So I'm actually going to start with Diane and also with Deborah um, to share some of your experiences in building those allies and getting partners to help you on the ground. Thank you. One of the things that we started out with is first, you know, Dallas is a city that's ran by a city management form of government. However, even though we're a city management form of government, we have a mayor and 14 city council people and a very active community. So our first court that we opened, we opened in the South Dallas area, which were majority of the households, over 50% of them fall below the poverty guideline over 80% of single family household. And so that was the area we started out in, but the good news was we started out in the Martin Luther King Center where there's over 20 different social service providers located on 10 acres of property there. We even have a full clinic there. So that was a good location, but we had to get the community to buy into it. So once we went to the Center for Court Innovation, we actually took city managers, then we took the council members because we had to get them to buy into it first. Then we had to secure the funding thanks to CDBG funding. That's what we secured. But then now was the real test. We had to get the community to buy into the fact that we are now putting a community court in the heart of your community and inside the Martin Luther King Center. And so that's a very protected area for them. So what we did was we started going out into the community and letting them know this is not your normal court. We started talking to them about, we're here to help. It's not a jailable offense. We want to make sure that if people are actually sitting under trees drinking beer, it's because maybe they can't get into the system. So we're actually trying to make sure we can help them by working with them to get them into the system. So once we got the community to buy into it, that was really, and we even to the point where we helped them, had them help us with even interviewing the staff that was going to come into the court. We literally made sure they participated in everything. And, and now that we've here 18 years later, we still continue to keep them actively involved. We go to HOA meetings, we go to crime watch meetings. We then decided to start building partnership in the community. And when we take them out for community service, we actually now support the vendors in that area because if they're gonna do community service, we provide food for them. So we support the vendors in the community too. We have dry cleaning that we have to do. So we actually support the vendor with the dry cleaning. So we give back to the community in so many different ways. And when our elderly and disabled need lawn services or they need minor home repairs, we take those defendants back into the community. And then they have to wear the large orange vest that has community court on them so that they can see everything we told you we were gonna do, we're doing it. And then at the end of each fiscal year, we do an end of the year report. So we let them know the data, how many people we have helped, how much we saved the city by letting them do community service, how many citizens we've actually done minor home repairs on. So we give them a year end report. So now they see not only are we talking to talk, but we are walking to walk too. And so we just keep the community involved, but it was some barriers. We had a county commissioner that was challenging us because they wanted to make sure we did everything right. So we got with the Dallas Police Department, another social service provider, and we started an initiative that we was recognized even from the White House on called the Prostitution Diversion Initiative. So those were some of the things that we did to make sure that the community know we was here to help and not hurt. Yeah, we often think of 
first going to our stakeholders, right, or our elected mm -hmm. officials to make sure that they are on our team. But I love that you're highlighting to make sure this is something the community actually is asking mm -hmm. for. And once they are your advocates and they are directly asking for it, then those stakeholders and elected officials will listen. Mm -hmm. And you can also know that you are fulfilling an actual need and not just right. making a program that won't be used um, or won't be needed. Really appreciate that. Deborah. How has it looked for you? Well, our approach obviously was a little different. Uh, this geographic area uh, in the Albany is about 90,000 people. And in our MSA, it's about 152,000 people. But we're also on that cor corridor between Georgia and Florida. And so we have a lot of people who do get caught up in, our, in the system coming through the area. Our, in this, our form of government is also a uh, mayor county commission uh, group um, and our commissioners actually appoint our uh, judges for the uh, municipal court and our public defender and, and solicitor for uh, and clerks of court so that they're involved on that level. Our One of our biggest pieces here was around trying to impact the mindset around the culture around having restorative justice, that the issue wasn't about you couldn't continue to always put people in jail or have people just pay fines, particular people who could not afford to. And most of the people who were coming to municipal court, where again, all of the, all of the cases there are misdemeanors, could not afford to pay the fines from the beginning. And as a part of that, we, because I said the, earlier that we have a lot of uh, very, very poor people in the area, we have a probably extremely large number of uh, nonprofit organizations in community service here, considering the size of our area. We have over 400 plus uh, nonprofit or community service organizations trying to deliver services. One of the interesting pieces is that as they're de doing that, they were not necessarily um, working in a way that they were networking in a way that would make sense. They were basically talking to the same people. What we did is started building our base through those coalitions and joining up with programs that were actually uh, working and looking for the opportunities to pull them in and help us look at what needed to happen. When we designed our pilot program, we had representation from all factors of the community service partners, as well as our educational in, uh, groups in the university, the technical college, the, the, uh, the uh, school system, the public school system. We also had members of the community that communities or sub-communities here as a part of that in giving us feedback and input around what could make sense. And we took that, that pilot and we tested that pilot for approximately nine months utilizing about 100 people coming through the courts in four different cohorts to test the components that would make sense. And it was on the basis of that and then doing major community needs assessment where everyone in terms of different groups within the community had an opportunity to give input around what made sense, what was working, what they'd like to see. Uh, what's been helpful is the fact that our chief judge has always wanted to do this kind of work and had been doing this on his own uh, in, in, in trying to get people uh, connected to the services that they would need. Now we build an infrastructure so that the court can actually do that in a real win-win way. If I can add to what Deborah is saying, uh, I can't uh, emphasize enough just how important those relationships are. And it's it's every single organization and person entity that has anything to do with your court I'm still learning this three and a half years in just you have to not only um, perform the outreach and the education with the community at the core but you have to anybody that's helping with your program you need to follow up you need to um, make sure that if they have any concerns or questions that you're addressing them uh, from law enforcement with our court who makes the initial referral before there's even a criminal citation and then potentially the criminal referral uh, all the way to the, the service providers. And when you're talking about the word of mouth, there's nothing more powerful than um, people who feel like they're making a difference, which anybody involved with this program on either side of the law is making a difference with uh, leading towards success for the participants. Um, but 
having regular meetings, put it on the calendar with, with law enforcement, um, include them in the process, include the service providers. And I think that's, that's what will protect you when there are issues with your court that are being brought up in the public sphere, because you do have people that will go to bat for you because they know that you have the right process in place and that you're getting the right results. But um, you definitely have to put in the time and effort on the education and building those relationships on a weekly, if not a daily basis. Absolutely. And it sounds to me that what you're all saying is that when you listen to those not stakeholders, community members, law enforcement, service providers, everyone in between, and when you're actually making the changes that are recommended that people are asking for, and you're holding yourself accountable to them, for example, with your annual reporting out, Diane, um, that people see you as more trustworthy and see you as more legitimate. Um, and they want to keep working with you because they know that you're not just operating a program for the program's sake, but it is really for the community's sake and for everyone's benefit. Judge Housen, um, we know it's not quite as easy as perhaps some of our experts make it sound. It, it's not, it's more than just going out and finding allies who just already exist and are ready to join your team. But more often it is, as Diane um, phrased it, building buy-in, really making the effort mm -hmm. to create relationships. So tell us, Judge House, and how that's looked for you. Well, I, I agree with this panel that it starts with a major passion for the whole program idea. Uh, I uh, talk about community court or the process almost everywhere I ever go. So it, 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 we have different governments. So we have, I have five city councils to keep happy and five mayors and uh, the county commissioners as well. Pros, all, that means five prosecutors, uh, five defense teams, all of those things. So, and each one of them is different. So I have real buy-in from some of them and others, I am constantly overcoming objections and hurdles placed in my path. And you have to be relentless in, in educating yourself. And I am constantly refreshing my education and my relationships and building a network that I can call on with questions and get support uh, as, as uh, I hit those uh, objections. And so building relationships, I am always raising my hand. Almost every calendar I appear on, I'm talking about my the community court, making sure that people are making referrals. I am, um, whenever I hear about a meeting of providers or maybe a law and justice council, I'm inserting myself into the process saying, I'd like to be on the agenda. How can I get myself at the table? Uh, it's a nonstop, but it's that is what is working. Uh, we at our Law and Justice Council, for example, all the heads of law enforcement are there as well as department heads for the entire county. And so I asked to get on the agenda to share updates on our statistics or our COVID recovery, those kinds of things. Talk about the flow from law enforcement to the court. Uh, and essentially what I'm really doing though is hearing their objections. And there are some law enforcement uh, agencies in our area who are not fully on board with our program, and we're constantly asking for uh, statistics and things like that. Thank you. And having had a little bit of a backseat to watching many of your court programs in, in process, I know that so many of the things that you do are really being a champion for your court and a champion for this lens for justice. Dave. Thank you, Lindsay. If I could add on to what uh, Judge Housen was mentioning about the constant uh, requests for statistics, especially from elected officials, I think that uh, statistics are obviously very important, but quantifying some of the results that come out of these courts specifically is nearly impossible. Everybody, everybody wants to talk about recidivism, but what about saving lives? I don't know how to quantify that, but I can definitely confirm that we have done that um, throughout the duration of this program, especially during the last three years where I've seen it firsthand with people that were at their, their lowest point. And if we weren't there, um, just the fact that uh, all our participants uh, receive a lunch when they come to court, like that meal alone may be the only meal they have for that day or a couple of days. And it's just, that's not something that you would, experience uh, in the traditional court. I think when 
people ask about statistics, especially if they're not familiar with the court, uh, I gladly invite them to come to court. But the important thing is that you can't just invite somebody. You have to um, explain what they're seeing because it's not going to be a traditional setup that they're used to. Um, I was asked just yesterday by a reporter about statistics, and, and I found myself telling the stories of participants who had been successful. And maybe it took a few times for that person to get to where they need, but um, we didn't give up. And so I could tell that um, when they saw firsthand uh, the process and it was explained to them, because it definitely was not familiar to them coming in, um, that helped. And statistics are important. Definitely keep statistics, especially like community service, people that you're helping, graduates. There's a number of different ways you can quantify what we're doing. But I think explaining the process is the most important thing I've found to have people relate and um, understand what we're doing. I, I just wanted to add that that's the number one tip I could give to anyone is overcoming objections with stories, success stories of all ranges of success, little successes, big successes and personalizing the story with an individual, having those individuals tell their story of success. It's the number one way to reach out and overcome objections and for people to understand in a human way. Everybody likes a good story. And if I could interject, I want to capitalize on what Dave just said. And that's one of the things is explaining to the people that community court is not your traditional court. And so you have to explain the process. Every year when we are audited, that's what I have to tell the auditors. You can't come in here and look at a community court as a regular court because they're like, well, why did Johnny come back three times? Well, as long as he keeps coming back, that means he still won't see help. And if he's been doing drugs for 17 years or what have you, he's not going to stop overnight. But we are here to make sure he connects with the right people. We're going to case manage him. We're going to put him in a treatment plan. And we're going to walk them through that process. And so education is definitely extremely important when we are talking about people helping people in community court. You can't look at us as a traditional court. But one of the things I was going to, also going to add, we look at is you know change your life, change the world. Um, mm -hmm. As I've had uh, folk come you know around the stats because I think you can quantify even those things that are not necessarily in numbers in terms of the movement. Uh, we're looking at where a person was when they first came came in mm -hmm. contact with us and how much further or where they are on their pathway to self-sufficiency in terms of looking at that movement. They are not the same in terms of when they first walked through the uh, through the door. The cost in terms of carrying people in systems or people having to rely on systems as opposed to being able to help them build or have the, some of the skill sets that they need to be or to move further along in their lives. We quantified that uh, in every day. And, um, and when we started talking about the cost to others by not helping people move forward, you know, the, you know, pay me now, pay me later is that kind of concept. So um, part of what we're also doing in our programs is we're, we're building in a big volunteer component, but we're calling our accountability coaches to help tie people to other folk to help them understand how even as they have their own uh, action plans that the courts have helped to set up, giving some support and someone to, you know, positively cheerlead them on um, as they make progress, learning how to navigate the systems that they have to go in and work through. Because the assumptions are, if people could just do that by just telling them that, there would be no reason for us to do what we're doing. That just doesn't happen. We're, we're combating uh, generational issues or multi-generational issues of, of not knowing or not doing or being stuck. So it is a long-term commitment. It is about cultural shift. It is an investment um, that pays out long-term. Thank you, everyone. I'm hearing how vital the power of stories is for each of your courts. I'm also hearing that although you have and you must, you know, keep track of your statistics, sometimes we have to be a little creative in how we can really capture that essence of success. Um, it, it's really hard to quantify some of the things that we do. As people have mentioned, um, a couple of the things that the Red Hook Community Justice Center has done is given community surveys out before and after just the existence of their community court. And what they found is that 
after the court had been in operation, in consultation with community members, they saw people um, healing in their communities and families, um, that people had a greater trust in law enforcement um, and the justice system. Just as a result, um, the researchers um, believe of the presence of the community court who took them and their needs into account. But another thing that the Red Hook Community Justice found that because of the reduced recidivism strictly among um, their court participants, that they saved millions, millions of dollars in costs to victims. So that's windows that were not broken, right? Um, that's people who didn't have to go to the hospital. Um, that's that's neighbors who didn't have to replace things that were stolen, um, stores that didn't have robberies um, or vandalism. So there are, when, when you think about just um, the individual recidivism, that's absolutely something we find to be true that in community court, there is less recidivism. But think about beyond that. Less recidivism means less crime, and less crime means less victims um, and less cost of victims. So it really is far-reaching. Um, something perhaps a little more technical, but that I know you all have had to grapple with um, in the beginnings and the ongoing processes of your court being in practice are policies and procedures manuals. And that's not something that might come to mind immediately as something so important. We need to do this first. Um, but I think you also all have seen in your practice just how vital it can be, especially with interdisciplinary teams and with different legal players in your court to make sure everyone's on the same page and everyone can be accountable. Um, I'll start with you, David, um, if you want to just share some of your experiences around using policies and procedures manuals specifically in your court. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, yeah, the policies and procedures manual was the first document that I read when I was uh, assigned to community court. And I, it's a lengthy document and I was trying to put my head around is this document necessary? And I quickly learned it's essential. Um, you can take the, the tried and true framework foundation from the Center for Court Innovation, from mentor courts, but each court needs to be tailored specifically to that location, to the population, um, and include um, specifics for the entities that are uh, at the table, making it all happen. Um, uh, three years in, I truly believe it needs to be a living document um, that things change. If anything, from the last couple of years, we've realized that the way that we did things two years ago or even a year ago probably are a lot different than they are right now. Um, that policies and procedures manual keeps everyone uh, accountable um, to each other, but it also I believe uh, sustains the community court over time because if you have different personalities enter into the program on, on that core team, whether it's the public defender, the judge, uh, the prosecutor, um, it, it defines the expectations and your role. Uh, it defines eligibility criteria for participants. Um, in our particular uh, court, uh, we don't have um, any assault cases um, allowed. And I know that's different by jurisdiction, but it's something that um, is written down. And so there's no question when that comes up. Uh, we also uh, don't permit people who have sex offenses um, in our court, and it's written down there. It doesn't mean that they can't access services, but as far as that case being eligible to be processed by us, we have something there and it, it supports myself as a prosecutor, but it also sort of supports the public defenders. Um, when somebody does get picked up and is in custody, um, there is um, an assumption that the person not only will have either a nominal bond or will be released um, in quick order. And so that explains exactly what to expect if somebody is in custody. Uh, and that the preference is for people not to be in custody. The preference is for people to be engaged with treatment or whatever else they might need. Um, so I definitely encourage each group um, to have a retreat every year and at least a portion of that retreat be dedicated to reviewing what you have and seeing if it still applies and seeing how you can make some changes going forward because um, I, I just can't express how important that is. And it also is an educational tool to people who aren't uh, familiar with your court. It's one of the first things 
that we will send off to people who want statistics. And we'll also send that um, uh, report that's evidence-based on the successes with recidivism that Lindsay was talking about, keeping those statistics. And those are two of the first things that we'll send to somebody before we have the full conversation and say, hey, here's the rest of the story, but this is kind of the, the foundation for what we do. And we do have a structure to us. Thank you very much. Deborah, was there more you wanted to add? I did. I, I wanted to, from the perspective of uh, that we're starting up, and for me, what that has been so powerful because it's ferreted out belief systems, you know, the assumptions around what the court is, what the court is about, what the court wants to do. There were assumptions about that. And until we started working through those policies and procedures and talking about what we wanted to do, what had to be done and the why, we were able to then get our judicial team on the same sheet of music as you talk about the prosecutors versus the public defenders, uh, even within the staff of the court where people have been dealing with things for so long, they become jaded in many cases you know, uh, to, to situations that come before the court. This forced that conversation, this forced uh, the court to start looking at what is the vision of what we're trying to do. Um, and where, where we are, and how will we know the difference? How will we affect lives? That kind of thing. So not only that, and then uh, supporting what Dave is saying, it gives you the roadmap. Anybody can come in and see where you are, what you're doing, why you're doing what you're doing, and where that's going. Um, and you've got that that backup. So uh, it's, it's critical in getting people on the same sheet of music around what is it we're trying to do, where we're going. Thanks, Deborah. Not only is it getting people on the same page, or as you say, the same sheet of music. It's also going back to what we've been talking about, giving a platform for people to feel that buy-in even more because they were part of the process. They were part of the decision-making of what actually goes on in this court and what the values are um, of the process. So I really appreciate that. Um, I think also, Dave, you had mentioned how this is a living document, which I think speaks to the nimbleness of the community court model, that we are accountable to change when there needs to be change. Um, we are able to withstand feedback and adjust accordingly. Um, so to that end, I wonder, um, David, I know um, you have seen responsiveness to issues going on in your court. Um, is there anything you want to say about that? Well, as far as it being a living document, um, everything we do is collaborative. And so that was something that took some adjustment for me coming in as being prosecutor, defense, defendant but actually working as a team. Uh, we don't stop communicating once court's done on Monday. Uh, it goes throughout the entire week. Um, if there's uh, proposed changes that I'm feeling pressure on as the prosecutor, they have to be approved by the whole team, which includes public defenders and the judge. Um, and I think that opens up a lot of really deep, um, productive conversations on uh, whether the proposed changes are going to be something that's going to benefit the court, but more importantly, is it going to benefit the people that we're trying to help? We may not always have the same opinion um, on what we want to see happen with changes on the document, but at least it forces us to have a productive conversation within our roles. Judge Housen, your courts are younger, um, but have you already been able to see evolution and responsiveness? I would agree with what's been said so far, and it's been critical that we have a living, breathing manual of procedures and that is constantly updated. And then we also set a schedule for meetings so and that everyone knows when those are. So every Monday between 10 and 12, we spend the first hour with our a limited team of advocates, the judge, uh, and we talk about issues. And then we bring in providers or people from the community for the second hour. So those regularly scheduled meetings, and then every 90 days, we have uh, a, a somewhat of a retreat, but we have it at our facility and we update, we just talk about issues and flush things out. And that has been critical and very, very helpful. The other thing that's been helpful is, is a brochure with our photographs on it, our contact information, a description of what we do. And at first when we didn't have that, it was just kind of a melee. So that's been very helpful to have for everyone to see. And you have to be willing to evolve as a, as a court. So when everything shut down in 2020, 
Um, we were one of the first courts to go back to in-person appearances, but we realized there were either people that were going to be um, out of safety concerned to be back in person or their providers who maybe weren't allowed by their agencies to appear in person. And a couple of years later here, we're just starting to see some of those providers um, appear. But while we were locked down, we started a weekly Zoom uh, staffing session and we had so many people on this, so many more people and providers and stakeholders than we had in person before COVID, from law enforcement to hospitals, fire department, housing, treatment providers, the list goes on. At one point, I think we had over 60 providers on one of these sessions, which is, we're pretty, pretty happy to ha be able to staff cases with so many people present, all working together. Um, and we've, even though we're back to in-person uh, staffings before court, We've continued with the Zoom staffings and I hope that we will going forward, even if we aren't seeing 65 and we're seeing closer to, to 30 uh, because we're splitting the attendance. It's still worthwhile because even if you're reaching a couple of people who otherwise wouldn't be there in person, um, I think that's, that's definitely worthwhile. So you have to be flexible. Um, even if you don't expect things are gonna change, you may need to change to, to stay relevant. Thanks so much. All right. I want to turn to a really big, important topic, which is sustainability. So I'm actually going to start just kind of sounding off everybody to give a three second response. So our listeners can hear um, what is your funding source or what are your funding sources? We'll just go to a few. Diane, I'm going to call on you last because your program has been in existence by far the longest of everyone on this, on this call. Um, so I want, we'll give you a few extra minutes to talk about how things may have changed over time um, and what sustainability has meant in your court. So Deborah, I'll start with you. Yes, well, we started off with a pilot program, and that was before we even knew about um, uh, community courts formally. We were able to convince our city to put up seed money, so to speak, to support the pilot. And a lot of that was around the way our pilot was designed. We also added a stipend component to that. Uh, as folk uh, completed uh, uh, parts of their work, their community service, and we were putting them in non-traditional community service roles. They were actually in roles within departments within the city uh, to build to, uh, more of their soft skills for employability. Uh, that's where our funding came from. The, our, since then, for developing the program and implementation, we uh, actually received a BGA grant to do that, and we're operating under that right now. But what we have also done is as we're building the program out, our design has been and uh, to get the city to actually fund this, to incorporate this in the expansion of our alternative sentencing components for the court. And that's working. It's not all in place yet, but the seeds have been planted. Actually, the plants have started to come up out the ground. Uh, so that's the direction that we're going uh, is around our city actually funding that and seeing where it's going to be value add. Thank you. And for our listeners, the BJA grant is the Bureau of Justice Assistance through the Department oh, yeah. of Justice, their National Community Court Initiative. More on that, I'm sure, during this conference. Judge Housen. We sought out a combination of grants. One was the BJA grant and then two state grants uh, totaling a, a, nearly a million dollars in grants funding. And we had no experience in grant writing. So I just don't want anybody, to, you just try, uh, do the best you can. It's very hard and uh, a mental leap, but so nearly a million dollars in grant funding. And then also I am constantly, as I said earlier, going to the county commissioners and the cities talking about funding. We have the ability to access a one-tenth of 1% 1 funding and we have not yet. That's a, a tax that is for these kinds of purposes, but there are a lot of competitors for those treatment accounts. And so we are getting in line for those as well. David. I would say our funding comes from creativity. <laughs> As in, uh, there is there are some funds from uh, our local government, um, but as far as the, the personnel is kind of the biggest expense and essentially the justification to uh, divert the prosecutor's time to this court, the public defender's time is that these are uh, 
criminal charges that would be filed regardless. And so if we didn't have a community court, we'd still have to prosecute these and handle these and defend these cases uh, in the other traditional court. So the personnel, um, just diverting what we already have. Uh, we've been very lucky, uh, very lucky to uh, have such a strong relationship with not only the community centers for the satellite locations, but the downtown library. Um, they hold us out as a priority. They're very proud to have us. And on the flip side, we ensure that we are excellent tenants for them when we're there, even if it's just one day per week, um, so that um, they can be proud of us. Um, we, when you start one of these courts, uh, the grants can definitely be important to justify uh, the initial uh, go with what you have. But long term, you have to find some sort of funding or some sort of um, organizations that can contribute in creative ways. So for us, uh, there's a local church that prepares and donates the lunches. So and that's a key part of the appearances for people. Um, we have uh, bus tickets uh, for people. We have uh, rideshare passes, which is one of the more recent innovations that we've made, but um, the bus routes don't always go everywhere. Um, also incentives are important when people are doing well, or if people have, uh, are in a crisis at the moment and they need essentials to have, have a backpack on hand that's full of items um, to get that person through if they're not receiving it someplace else. And then when somebody graduates to include uh, kind of a goodie bag that also has essentials for that person um, to reward them for the work that they've put in. So I'd say creativity, uh, you do have to um, have the support, at least for us, of the city council and the mayor, but ultimately um, you have to get creative in how, uh, what you need and how you get it. Great advice. And Diane, tell us how your program has sustained itself all these years. So for the last 18 years, three of our courts has received community development block grant money. And so most large Metroplex get that grant. And that was one of the ways we started by funding those three courts. Two years in, BJA actually recognized us as a mentor court. And for the last 16 years, we've been a mentor court. During that process, the attorney general at that time gave us another $300,000 grant to start a youth initiative for young people between the ages of 18 and 25. And then it just started flowing in from there. We actually received another grant from the Texas Veterans Commission. Our first grant from them was for 300,000 to create a docket just to help our veterans. And so we just applied, our, one of our council members would always say, you know what, it's always good to get grants. It's always good to spend other people money. And so we started that process and, and we have an excellent grant writing. But not only that, you have to be, as I tell most people, my theme song is Ain't Too Proud to Beg. And so one of the things that we do in that sense is that what we had to do, we had to go out to other profits because there was, and that was administration money. So all of those grants took care of administration. However, what they didn't take care of was the direct services to help the individuals like with ID, getting a copy of their birth certificate. So we had to go to other foundations to secure funding. So we went to the Foundation for Community Empowerment. They gave us a grant that would help us pay for DPS, which is the public safety uh, fees that we have to pay for, getting their driver's license. And if they needed tools to go to work, we secured funding to actually pay for that. In addition to the Foundation for Community Empowerment, we actually received another grant from the Meadows Foundation. So the Meadows Foundation was able to fund our security system in the court system as well. So we went to them to get things that we couldn't get from the government that would help pay. Then we was able to secure the SAMHSA grant. That was the grant that was able to help us with that people that would do a diagnose where they had mental issues, but then they was trying to self-medicate themselves. So now we can actually pay for treatment. So we are always looking for grants and better ways that we can actually service the citizens. We had one prosecutor that actually got a grant from BJA that started a unique court called SKIP where they was helping uh, teenagers between the ages of 18 and 25, but they then started a partnership with Dallas County. That was a first for a community court that was now partnering with a county court. So those are just some of the things, but really it's just making sure that you market yourself. You have to be able to tell your story. 
be able to show the evidence yeah. and be able to send that out to them. That is one of the things that help you secure funding mm -hmm. when you're saying I'm enhancing a program, not that I'm starting a new. Um, what I wanted to also add, um, add what Diane and uh, David were talking about is what we're learning too is through the collaboration with other partners is mm -hmm. how it, not necessarily where we're getting money, but we have clients or people who fit their profiles for their grants. And so we're routing people through the, <clears throat> excuse me, through their programs to receive those benefits and we track them. We, we, we have a tracking component for that. And so, because the end point isn't that we need to have a lot of money. The end point is that we're servicing our, our folk and getting them where they need to be. So that's been really powerful as we start to set up, set that up. So as an example, one of our anchor partners is our technical college. And so as the, the age group that, that we're working with, and so we're routing people or with the judges routing people to go back to school, get their GEDs, get build skill sets, things like that. We're working directly with the technical college who in turn have, have multiple programs that fit the profile of, our people fit the profile of a lot of the programs. And as we bring them into the school, we set, like, we set up a, uh, a package around them uh, that supports them all the way through their uh, personal action plans or the, the kinds of skill sets they need to get. And so funding comes through, through the school, through their grants to support that. So trying to be, like you said, David, be creative, being smart and leveraging all the dollars in the communities. That's, that's I think it's gonna be very helpful for us. Well, I think it only makes sense that with community courts that look different wherever they are, depending on the population served and have different personalities who all come together to set policies, that you'd have very different um, funding profiles and that you've all been really creative to make it work in your area. I have to say, though, you make it sound pretty easy. You've all worked really hard. I know you have. Um, in our remaining time, I'm going to actually pause now and let you think about some parting advice that you might want to give to some new upstart community court practitioners or folks who are just thinking about um, bringing a community court to their jurisdiction. Um, just maybe two minutes of advice um, that you can give as we are finishing up uh, this panel. So I'll go in the same order as we began. I'll begin uh, with you, Diane. Um, what would you say to someone who is interested in or trying to start a community court? First, I would say, make sure you don't wear your feelings on your shoulders. Uh, the first thing is, is to do a survey of your community. What are some of the needs in that community? Don't go in thinking that, you know what, I have the answer. We're going to save all of you guys. Don't go in with that person, that, that attitude. Do a survey, and that's what we did. We found out what are some of the needs in the community? What are some of the needs? And we did it in categories as far as public safety, education, health. And that's what we actually did a study on that first. Once we did a study on it, then we were able to go to the community. We first went to the community and presented that case to them, telling them, here are some of the needs in your community. Then after we told them that we were trying to put together a plan as to how we can address those needs. Then what you need to do is now get your elected officials involved and not just your city council and the mayor, but in that area, we have state representatives, a congressional person. So we wanted all of them involved. We actually got our faith-based organizations involved too because you can't have too much support because again, Deborah said it earlier, one of the things when people think court, the first thing come to mind, either I'm going to jail or I'm gonna have to pay money that I don't have. So we had to erase that stigma that this is not this kind of court. It is actually an assessment driven court where we are trying to help people. And you have to do what you say you were going to do. So that's one of the first thing is, is put out your action plan, but also make sure you're flexible and you're able to listen to what the stakeholders, what the community, what the faith base, what the nonprofits, listen to what they have to say. Everybody that comes into community court is treated with respect. They are Mr. and Mrs. And then when they actually graduate at the end of the session, we make a big deal of it. We give them a completion certificate. You guys, we have had people tell us one guy so say he had never had a cap and gown on. And that was his first time mm -hmm. ever wearing a cap and gown. Something we took for granted. I was like, oh, 
I can't even remember how many times I've had a cap and gown on. But those are things we took for granted. And that was his first time ever putting one on. Also giving them the certificate and giving them the bags and putting little goodies in those bags and making a big deal out of the graduation, making sure we understand what their accomplishment was. Because guess what? Those people that have gone through your program are your best advertisers. They are the best. Why? Because they can tell you they really do what they say they're going to do. And so that's why we treat them so special. We treat them like kings and queens because they're our best advertisement. And that's the best way to start a court. Set your plan and work your plan. You just gave a mini lecture on procedural justice. And I don't know if you know it, but you sure did. Really appreciate that, Diane. Thank, thank you. you. Yep. And David. I just want to say in closing, thank you so much for the Center for Court Innovation and their technical team. That's who helped us all along the way from day one. So I just want to say a special thank you to them. You're very welcome. David, what, what advice would you like to share? Three and a half years ago, I was assigned, we, we joked that I was voluntold that I was going to be the new community court prosecutor. And I, I didn't feel like it was going to be something I would enjoy. I didn't come into it with the open mind that it deserved because I appreciated the routine of the traditional court. And within the first day of being down there, I realized that this is the most challenging and rewarding uh, role that someone in my office could have. Um, I now, three and a half years in, have multiple times declined to switch to different dockets. Um, I take ownership in what I do. I try to uh, take it upon myself to not only educate stakeholders and law enforcement and everybody else about what it is, but also my peers within my office, because I was one of them before that didn't really know what was going on. And so I think it's important to bring more people into the program. And once they really experience it, they can appreciate it. Um, stay the course. There's definitely going to be uh, political and social landmines all the time. <laughs> it seems like every week. However, if you have a strong program and you believe in what you do, which all of us here clearly do, um, you can withstand all those challenges. And if you can also uh, stay positive and educate people in the process, you're going to come out on the other end a lot stronger. Um, as far as nuts and bolts for advice, I would say if you're going to get any funding, please try to get a dedicated coordinator for your court, at least for us. That's one of the only fundings um, provided by the city councils for a dedicated coordinator. And to have somebody who is at the center of uh, the organization and education and outreach um, parts of what we do. It takes, some of the, takes a lot of the burden off of the rest of the team. We still have a lot of things that we do, but to be able to delegate that to a professional um, makes it so that we can focus on the participants and not always just on the program. So I think that is a key uh, person to add to your team. Thank you for having me here today. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Great advice, Dave. Appreciate it. Judge House. Thank you. I would say just don't expect yourself to be an expert on anything and don't worry about barging ahead when you don't know the answers. The answers are out there. The Center for Court Innovation is extremely beneficial in information and support. Don't shy away from grants just because you think they might be too much work. They are extremely rewarding as well. Uh, I, I was told no more times than I could count and more times than I wish to even think about, but you just persevere. I have a poster on my wall that says perseverance, and I would just check in with it regularly. Uh, there's a lot of resources out there uh, for support and for learning. And the other best tip I can give is that we started with absolutely nothing. So I started the concept saying we're just going to treat the culture in the courtroom a little bit differently without any money. Uh, and so you can forge ahead when you're not sure and learn as you go. It's it's OK and it works out well in the end. And so that's my best advice for you. Persevere, persevere. I know you've done that, Judge. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your time. And Deborah. 
Yeah, there were two things I, I, I thought about as a, a being a, a, a very brand new uh, group where we're building this plane while we're flying. Um, and that's uh, the technical support that we got was just amazing, you know, to be humbled and accepted that somebody knows what they're talking about. And you don't have to just keep reinventing a wheel, just a, reapply shamelessly. Um, and so making sure, like, uh, I think the other piece for me around that is surrounding myself with people who know uh, a lot about what we're trying to do and, and bowing to that, that leadership in, in that guidance. I would also say one of the things that's super powerful to me was invest in understanding the culture that you're trying to affect and the culture that you're having to operate within critical, I think, in terms of we made some missteps or we also found some advantages once we really focus on understanding that. The mentor courts, we're now finally positioned to take advantage of some of the courts that, you know, that are here today on this panel uh, around things that they've learned, uh, things that they know, things that can help us um, just move, move things faster because it is about getting people uh, to where they need to be. And now we can leverage the collective. And now this has become a movement. Um, so that's that's what I would advise or share. Thank you, Deborah. And a huge thank you to all of our panelists who've been here today, not just for your time and your expertise here um, for this session, but also for the work that you're doing every day um, in your home jurisdictions. Really cannot appreciate you enough. And also a huge good luck to all of our viewers who may be embarking on your own community court projects. You have lots of people in the field who can give you great advice. And of course, my colleagues on the training and technical assistance team here at the Center for Court Innovation are always here to help everyone be well and have a wonderful day.